He has something for us today. Are you ready to receive it? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you this morning, Lord, it doesn't matter how we feel this morning. It doesn't matter what we feel like. If we feel good, if we feel bad, if we have headaches, if we have tummy aches, if we come in just aches and pains all over or whatever, it doesn't matter, Lord. It really doesn't matter. Lord, you have something to give to us today, Lord. You have something, Lord, Lord, for us to receive from you today, Lord. Lord, I pray, Lord, that whatever we come in with, whether we're just tired or exhausted from the week or whatever, or whether we're just on cloud nine, Lord, I just pray, dear Father, Lord, that any of that, Lord, would not discourage us, Lord, today from receiving everything that you have for us, that you want to pour out, everything that you have for us, Lord, in the Holy Spirit, Lord, what you want to do today, dear God. Lord, as we said in morning prayer with the, with the pastor this morning, Tony read something and talking about shaking the very foundations of this place, Lord, with your Holy Spirit, with your presence. Lord, we pray that that would happen today, dear God. Lord, I don't want to receive anything less, Lord, than what you have for me today. So, Lord, I pray, dear Father, Lord, that you'd help us, Lord, this morning, Lord, to focus on you. Tune everything out. Lord, the enemy is, he, he is, he's crouching, he's waiting outside the door. He, he's also probably even in here walking around trying to distract us, cause chaos, Lord. And, Lord, he has no place here. So, in the name of Jesus, we cast him out. And, Lord, we ask, dear Father, Lord, that you would speak and move this morning today. Help us, Lord, as we worship. Help us, help us to give all glory and honor and praise to you because you are worthy. You alone are worthy. We thank you and praise you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's worship. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face. All What you're going through, one of these days it'll be worth it all. Amen. You say it might be hard here every now and then, but it's going to get easier as you go. I tell you, God's promised that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning. Why is that? Because God loves us. God loves us so much. Let's sing about that love this morning. Such love, such love. Such wondrous love that God should love a sinner such as I. How wonderful is love like this.
planning on going to heaven. Amen. Your name's going to be called out one of these days. Jesus is going to call your name, and you'll be saying, Lord, I'm ready to go in by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. By his blood, I'm saved. And I'm going to heaven one of these days, that wonderful place that I can call my home forever and forever. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather on the other shore, yonder I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise, the glory of his resurrection shall the Lord. Man. Well, I am thankful that one day the roll is going to be called. And the thing about it is this. You may hope that it's not called, but your name will be spoken. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, it's the judgment. Your name will be called. And we're either going to heaven There's only two options. Right. Oh, may our names be written down. Man. Yeah. Woo, praise the Lord. Well, this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer, all that would just gather in around the altar. Man, we're just, we're just going to seek him today. We're trusting him. Oh, boy, I love that song. Man, that's powerful. Man, man, when the roll is called up yonder, thank for what he's going to do. And, man, we just go right into this prayer season of, Lord, we are trusting you. Even right now, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you because we trust you. We trust you, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, that we can bring our needs to you. We, we trust you that we can bring our cares to you. We, we trust you that, Lord, when we've had a hard time, we can come to you. And, Lord, we can really share our feelings, how we really feel, because you can handle it. And we can come to you and we can say, God, this is how I'm feeling right now. And we, we are so real with you in our prayers because you already know us. You already know how we're feeling. You already know what we're thinking. So, Lord, I pray that you'd help us. May we learn in our prayer time. The more real we are with you, the more you can break through. And so, Lord, I'm praying that today, today, Lord, even during our prayer time, Lord, help us to be real. We're not praying just to pray. Whether it's at the altar, whether it's in a pew, wherever it may be. We're not praying just to pray. We just don't want to repeat and recite and, and, Lord, just continually just do things over and over and it not mean anything. Lord, we want to come to you. And on our best days, we give you praise. And on our hardest days, we give you praise. Because you alone are worthy of that. 
And so I pray, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, this morning, you, you know every need that's in this place. You know what every single person is praying about. You know where they're at with you. You, you know if they're walking on that road to glory and they're getting ready, Lord, you're going to call out their name one day. And man, they're going to be there. You know it. But Lord, you also know right now the one that's struggling. The one that's truly looking at this road and they're trying to make a decision. And they're trying to say, is this road really worth it? Is this road, is this road truly going to be the answer to my life? I pray, dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, right now, reveal yourself. And we do right now. We, we pray in the name of Jesus. We come together. Lord, may we corporately, may we just do this right now. And we say right now in the name of Jesus, Satan is bound. He has no authority. He has no authority. And Lord Jesus, right now, with him trying to blind people, we pray, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, that, Lord, he's held back. And, Lord, your light just continues to shine through. And so, Lord, we thank you right now for the chains that will be broken today. Lord, may we not come to church empty-handed in our faith. But may we come believing that you will do what you said you would do through your word. Your word is truth. And you said that the truth will set people free. Lord, I'm thankful for the day that I was set free by the truth of who you are. So, Lord, today we ask that you just continue to do that. You continue to bless us, dear Heavenly Father. Lord, we love you so much. I pray, Lord, that you just continue to bless our time together as we're here. Lord Jesus, that as we sit back and we say, man, thank you for these songs that we've got to sing. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that it will be worth it all one day. Curtis was right. It's going to be worth it. And I pray to Heavenly Father, Lord, that we would hold on to you. We cling to you, the author and finisher of our faith. So, Lord, we love you so much. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, in advance. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. Lord, you are so good. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we are here today. We don't want to miss one single thing that you have for us. Lord, may we have ears to hear today what your Spirit is speaking to us. And may we be the people that respond. We love you so much. Lord, we give you praise for all things. I thank you, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, for the healing that's coming.
is here. Hallelujah. He is here. Amen. He is here. Holy, holy. I will bless his name again. He is here. Listen closely. Hear him calling out your name. He is here. You can touch him. You will never be the same. I sense an awesome moving of the Holy Spirit. I see his countenance resting on your face. I know that there are angels hovering all around us for the presence of the is in his place. He is here. Hallelujah. He is here. Amen. He is here. Holy, holy. I will bless his name again. He Hear him calling out your name. He is here. You can touch him. You will never be the same. I searched for peace among the shadows dark and lonely. Gave up on finding that strong and lasting love. I tasted all the things that sin could think to offer me. But today I feast on manna from above. He is here, hallelujah. He is here, amen. He is here, holy, holy. I will bless his name again. He is here, listen closely, hear him call. same. He is here. You can touch him and you will never be the same. Joshua chapter 7 is where we will be at today. Joshua chapter 7. Hmm. Hey, what do y'all think about that piano being over there? Yeah. Some of y'all are like, we got a piano? <laughs> yeah. Anybody, anybody realize that it moved? We just came in one day and it was there. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Do what now? Well, see, that's what we've done. Y'all looked at him long enough. Everybody's <laughs> 
We got to let them see his dancing fingers over here, right? They got to they gotta see him over here, right? Oh, me. He said this side is actually his better side of his... I'm just joking. That ain't what he said. That ain't what he said. I'm just joking. So he... Uh, yeah, he, 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 coming around, coming around. The mile lap was too much. He came back over here. Oh, man. It's all good. Lord still moves. Lord still speaks, right? Joshua chapter 7, after you found that, if you would, stand out of reverence of God's word. Man, what a word. What a word. What a word. Man. Man, Joshua chapter 7, be starting in verse 10. Starting in verse 10. Word of the Lord says this, <clears throat> the Lord said to Joshua, get up, why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned, they have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them, they, they have taken some of the devoted things, they have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. Hear that verse. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. Boy, that's a tough verse. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Verse 13 says this, get up. Consecrate the people and say this, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, There are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. Lord Jesus, this is your reading. This is your word. This, your word is powerful. And we thank you, Lord, for it. On the days that it's the toughest to read your word. On the days when your word cuts us. On the days that your word challenges us. Your word is still good. And so I pray dear Heavenly Father Lord that today you just tell I, I need your help Lord. I need your help Lord. I need you. I trust you. But your word. Your word does not return void the scripture says. And so, Lord, today, would you just continue to have your way? Thank you, Lord, for being in our presence. We realize that we're not worthy of that, yet you come anyway. And so, Lord, continue to accept what we have to offer and speak to us, Lord, in a mighty way. Lord, would you just continue? I me behind the cross, Lord. You're only seen and heard. Lord, may th th this is you, Lord. This is you. And I need you today. Just as everybody else, Lord, I need you. We love you so much and we give you praise. We ask these things in Jesus' name. We all say it together. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. I'm going to share with you some, uh, some ads that were uh, posted and uh, put in newspapers and on the internet and things like that. Some ads that should have been proofread. Before they got put out, one said this, dinner special, turkey, 235, chicken or beef, 225, children, $2. <laughs> yeah. They should have proofread that one just a little bit and then a little bit nerve wracking. You can start going through that menu and you wonder what's next, right? <laughs> oh, me. Here's one that uh, Bank had put out. It says, save regularly in our bank. You'll never re-get it. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, my. Woo, that makes you nervous, too, don't it? Yeah, man. Here's, here's one I thought was pretty good. Um, it says this, illiterate, question mark, write today for free help. <laughs> They should have thought that one through just a little bit better. When they get there. Ah, here's, here's one of my favorite. Josh, you'll like this one. I, I thought this was pretty good. <clears throat> Auto repair service. Free pickup and delivery. Try us once. You'll never go anywhere again. 
<laughs> oh, man, they, what in the world? Are you kidding? Are you kidding? Yeah. I'm not making those up. Those, those are really there. So, oh, man. Josh says, come on out. He doesn't have that slogan. All right, he don't have that slogan. Oh, man. So you got to make sure you proofread. All right? I, I don't know about you, but, boy, you better proofread the text before you send it. Autocorrect is not your friend. No, you, you could send some things and be like, man, I can't take that back. <laughs> it's, it's already out there. But anyway, oh, so this morning I want to I want to preach a message that, that's just in, entitled this. Uh, remember how? Remember how? Remember how? Remember how? <clears throat> you look through the book of Joshua, man. Book of Joshua, is, man, it, it's awesome, right? Get all excited, and you see Moses has just went on to heaven, right? It says God buried him. Nobody knows where that God buried him. Man, whoo, that's special. That's special. God buried him. He said, you come on up here, I'll bury you, I'll take care of you. Man. Joshua is, moves in as the successor, going to be leading these two million plus people and going to be helping them to take over the role of where Moses was at. Now, I, I don't know about you, but man, two million people and trying to lead them. Oh boy. He, I can tell you, Joshua was saying this, thank you, Lord, for Moses. Being the leader before I got here. Helped me, get, gave me some instruction. Because he was listening to you and how to do some of these things that we got. So chapter 1 would show us uh, as Joshua takes over uh, as leader and kind of goes through some things. And then it's encouraging when you read chapter 1. Man, that's encouraging stuff as Joshua comes in. And man, these, these people are like, man, we got to let You know, we're not wandering around like, like sheep without a shepherd, right? They got somebody in there going to lead them where they need to be. Uh, chapter 2. Right? We'll see that the spies are sent out, right? They got something they got to do. And so the spies are sent out to the land, and uh, they go over there, and uh, specifically Jericho, and are, are looking at that. And then in the midst of that, remember Rahab? You hear the story of Rahab? Uh, you go into the New Testament, you find her in the genealogy. You find this name, Rahab, right? It's her. And man, she hid the spies and took care of them. And that, that way they could get away. And <clears throat> chapter 3 shows us Israel crossing the Jordan. Man, what a tremendous story that is, right? Crossing the Jordan at flood stage, right? Not crossing the Jordan when it was dried up already and it hadn't rained for eight months. Crossing the Jordan at flood stage, right? Man, that, that story saw, and man, as soon as the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, as soon as their feet hit the water, <laughs> Uh, I'll preach on that maybe sometime, but maybe I don't know. Maybe I already have. I can't remember. But anyway, chapter four talks about the twelve stones. That as they were going through, they went back and got the twelve stones out of the Jordan and set up. Remember that, man. That's a that's an awesome message, right? You want to usually most time uh, pastors preach something like that on Children's Day or or even Baby Day. Why? Because it's memorial, right? Uh, remembering, you know, that children are going to ask, man, why are these twelve stones here? And he says, man, when you hear that, tell them the story. Your kid ever ask you why you come to church? Tell them the story. Well, it's just the thing we do. <laughs> no wonder churches are in decline. Church ain't something we do. Man, it's something we get to do because of Jesus. Man, we, whoo, we love him. We come in. Woo, woo. Anyway. Chapter 6 leads us into the Jericho walls, right? And they fall. Chapter 5 leading up to that. And chapter 6, man, we have this story of the Jericho wall. I mean, absolutely. Uh, Joshua, you come in, and what we're going to do, we're going to do this. Now, as a leader, we want everybody to hush. Mighty crosses the Jordan, and now you're going to take this down. We're going to show them how mighty of a leader you are by how quiet you can be. That should help us all. A leader ain't by how much we talk, how forceful we may think we can be. A leader is how obedient we are to the Lord when he speaks. And Joshua says, oh, that's my first task. Hey, everybody listen up. Don't say anything. We're going to do it for seven days, and then we're really going to have a party. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, man, chapter 7. 
gets us into this sense of they had just come out of this victory of Jericho. Man, every city around was absolutely shaken. Because if you can get into Jericho, you can get into anything. No city going to be bigger than theirs. No city stronger than theirs. No city more fortified than theirs. And man, all of a sudden this happens and people are like, man, they've got this God they serve and he's just obliterating things. They go into this little city called Ai here at the beginning of chapter 7. And it goes in and and they get to a place of of where they're saying, hey, uh, man, we don't, you know what? The spies went out, did the exact same thing. They came back. You know what they said? They said, oh, man, Joshua, don't even worry about it. Scripture says this, just send two or 3,000 of our men. That's all you've got to do. We don't need any more of the army. You just send them up there and we are going to take care of business. And scripture says, I think it was, is it say 36? I think it's 36 got killed. Lost 36 men. Now we say, well, that ain't a lot. They went to Jericho and didn't lose one. Be careful lest you win a big victory and think you can do the next one on your own. May lose something. So all of a sudden we see this and man, 36 men have, have died and they come back running. Watch this. They came back running. They turned their backs on the enemy and fled after just coming through a big victory. After just kind of saying, whew, man, we are something. <laughs> look what we done. We were just silent and look what happened. Now we get to this point. Scripture tells us that in the midst of that, the first thing that Joshua does is what a leader should do. Scripture says this, especially in this time frame, what the Jewish people would do, the Israelites. And it says that he tore his clothes. Mourning. Going to sit and, and, and all this and say, man, I cannot believe what has actually happened. It says that he falls on his face in front of the ark of God. He, he goes into the front of the ark of God, tears his clothes and falls on his face and begins to cry out to the Lord at this moment. Well, praise the Lord. That's better than coming back and sending 6,000, thinking there's going to be a different, uh, something else happen. Before he did anything else, he had learned from Moses. He said, hey, stop, we got to pray. Something ain't right. Now watch this. He didn't know what wasn't right, but he went to the source that did. But nobody else going to be able to reveal anything because as you read through this story, you'll, re- you'll realize the one that did something wasn't about to reveal it. Because if they were about to reveal it, we wouldn't have had to go through this whole story of everything that it says of how they had to go down and go down and go down. And finally, when they got all the way down to the family, they figured out who it was. If Joshua hadn't done this, they wouldn't have known. And all of a sudden, they just kept losing, kept losing, kept losing, kept losing, kept losing, kept losing. I don't know if you realize this. Not most Christians try to live their life that way. Because they think, well, I lost there. If I just do something a little bit better, I can get it. Scripture tells us this. Fall on our face and cry out to the God who knows everything. So anyway, we get into this part here. Whoo, boy. Man, it's good stuff. Joshua goes down, and and the thing that we need to realize is Joshua's heart is in the right place. If you miss Joshua's heart, you'll miss everything. He wasn't mad in the sense of that they got defeated. He wasn't mad just because they lost the battle. He was upset because he was missing something that was going on. In some of our families, there's things that are going on and we're missing it because we ain't took time to get down on our face and pray. And we keep wondering why we got problems in our family and we keep trying to pour money at it. We keep trying to throw pills at it. We keep trying to throw counseling at it. We keep trying to throw all these things at it. And God's saying this, if you'd ever just get down on your face and pray, I could do something. But yet we've allowed our family to go to hell in a handbasket thinking that we can figure out the problem outside of Jesus. Praise the Lord for Joshua. He didn't try that. And so what he said was this. I'm going to go to the place where I get answers. 
Well, the scripture says that he falls down there. And Joshua begins to ask the Lord for answers in verses 8 and 9 in the sense of saying, Hey, we, we don't, I don't know what actually happened there, but Lord, you've got to tell me. Whoo, boy. Now, you get to the end of verse 9 there and you'll see that he says this, For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it. Uh, hear of, watch it. Will hear of our defeat. We'll hear how we fled. We'll hear how we were cowards when it came down to it. We didn't even stay and fight. They took off running. And he says, they're going to hear of that and all the surrounding. And, I, and that, watch this. They'll cut our name off from the earth. And then watch what he says. And what will you do for your great name? Now, why you? His heart is asking the question because he's trying to figure out what's going on. And he's saying, God, if we keep getting wiped out, what are you going to do with your name? I need some answers about what's taking place here. Now what? God gave him the answer. He came with the right heart and the right attitude. Listen to me. You can go to God upset sometimes and still have a good heart. Be angry and sin not. You go to God and you start calling him every name except who he is, you've got a problem. He ain't answering and all that. But when we go to God and we say, I understand who you are, but I'm frustrated right now. Don't understand all this stuff, and that's the reason I come to you and not somebody else. Because ain't nobody else can give me the answer that I need, and they can't handle me talking to them this way. So I'm going to talk to you, the one that can handle it. Now. Then we get into verse 10. God speaks. Now listen, when God speaks, don't mean it's going to be easy. Man, we, we love for God to sugarcoat stuff on us and make it easier on our life. But I promise you, sometimes he's going to say, now do it. You ask, I'm telling you, do it. Now, all right, verse 10. Move on, move on, move on. I am. The Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Just as we can't miss Joshua's heart in the first part of it, don't miss what God's saying to Joshua right here. It's not a rebuke. Listen to It's not a rebuke. Joshua ain't done anything. So don't look at God coming at Joshua saying, you need to get up. I don't know why you're dead. It's not a rebuke in that way. It's a thing of God saying this. Hey, I'm here to speak to you, but you do need to realize some things are taking place. And I'm getting ready to tell you what those are. God says, you want answers? Get up. Don't keep lying down face forward for right now. Don't keep saying that you're going to be wiped out. I'll let you know what it is. But quit, watch it, quit wallering in your self-pity. Because if you'll quit doing that, I can give you some stuff that will help you is what God says to him. He said, now stop. Don't be saying all that stuff. What is it going to be when my name's wiped out? No, 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 no. My name will always be, he says. I am that I am. You go over to Revelations. You know what the word says? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You ain't doing away with his name. So when watch it, Joshua's coming in. What Joshua's coming in in the physical human formness. Why? Because he is frustrated about what's happened, but he says it. Now watch it, Joshua. I am who I am. I spoke to your leader prior through a burning bush. You think I don't know that my name is great? Now he gets here. And he says, so if you quit doing all that, I'll give you the answer. Watch this. Go into your prayer closet. Get rid of all that stuff that's holding you back. Tell God how you feel and then quit wallering in it. And allow him to speak to you. That way you get the answer. Because if you go into your prayer closet just to say you've been into your prayer closet, we're no better than the Pharisees that Jesus spoke of. Verses 11 through 13, man said, whew, boy, great day in the morning. Probably not what Joshua was wanting to hear. What leader in their right mind would want to hear? Hey, hey, 
Heads up, sand's in the camp. Ah. Don't think Moses didn't have that problem. Read the scriptures. God, you gave me these stick neck people. <laughs> gotta have a right heart, though. Watch it. Gotta have a right heart. You talk to God, and God said, Now you got that all out of the way. Now let me talk to you. So, verses 11 through 13, he goes down through there. Israel sinned. They couldn't transgress my covenant. Watch this. Watch this. Understand this. The people knew what they were supposed to do before they ever got there. Right? None of them had an excuse to say, I didn't know. You won't find that in Scripture. You won't find that at the end of this story. When what has to be done, watch this. It has nothing to do with they were unaware. They were very aware. So we go down through and he says, hey, they broke my covenant that I commanded them. You say, well, that was just for Moses. That was just for Joshua. That was, No, 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 no. That was for the people. He says, you will be my people and I'll be your God. He is a personal God and he comes in. So then he goes down through there and he says, hey, they've taken some of these devoted things. They've done all this stuff. And then you get down to verse 13. In verse 13, look at how he starts out now. And he starts out and he says this. Now get up, which is saying this. Now you know, but now it's got to be dealt with. Why did it? The first was get up, quit wallering in it. The second was get up. I gave you the answer. Now you better do something about it. Why did it? You better do something about it because if you're going to ask for the answer, you better be willing to deal with the answer. Don't go to God and say, God, if you'll just give me the answer, I'll do it. He gives you the answer and you back off of it. I promise on judgment day, you'll be held accountable for it. Because God will say this, I gave you the answer because you asked for it and you did absolutely nothing with it. Because if we're not careful, we'll try to play God. And say, man, I got one over on him. God already knows. God already knows. Now anyway, moving on down. <laughs> If we ask God how to deal with the situation and then we don't do it, just an example here. If you ask God how to deal with your situation, if you ask God what job to take, if you ask God how to get to victory and then he gives you the answer and you don't do it, don't blame anybody else. And listen to it. Don't you dare come into church whining and complaining about your job. Well, pastor... I thought you prayed about it. Oh, come on. I thought you prayed about it. Now, listen to me. Don't tell me God gave you that job. You didn't pray about it. You got the job. Well, God gave it to me. Did you pray for it? Well, no, I just felt like it, it just at the time may be the right thing to do. So you took something you didn't even pray about. And then you're going to walk in and you're going to say, well, you just don't understand my job. I understand you didn't seek enough time with the Lord. Quit coming in here whining and complaining and taking all, watch this, taking everything that you've got and affecting everybody else. Because your cancer is going to spread through everybody else and they're going to start complaining and they ain't got no reason to. Did you realize that? Some people ain't got no reason to complain about their job. It's a good job. But if you hang around people who complain about their job, you'll find something about your job. And you'll start complaining about it. Get over it. And watch this. If God gave you the job, and you say, I know he gave it. They quit wallowing in it. You say, Patty, you're just preaching too hard. No, what I'm saying is this. Why affect the church for you coming in and acting like a baby all the time? It ain't worth it. It'd be like me standing up here saying, well, I just don't want to deal with these people. The only difference is, huh, I'm, I'll get a paycheck here. How many of you all going into your boss's office and sitting down and saying, well, I just want you to know, I just don't like you know. Probably not. You know why? Because you're coming here and gossiping about it. You ain't willing to talk to your boss about it. Keep your mouth shut. I'm moving on. You say, what do you say? I say, quit asking for God to do stuff for you, and then you don't do it. Because God will say next time, don't ask. 
because you didn't do nothing with it the first time. I just don't know why I can't get answers because he gave it to you the first time. He can't trust you to do anything with it. You say, Pastor, are you serious? I'm absolutely serious. Why is God going to trust you with something that you're not willing to do? Well, I wish I just had that gift. Well, you're not even using the gift he gave you. Quit asking for another gift that you're not using the gift he gave you. you. Your eyes haven't been opened to what he's given to you for you to be able to help the kingdom, yet you're wanting a greater gift. And watch it. You go over and read in Corinthians, he'll tell you, quit it. Quit asking for that stuff. We want a church to grow without being obedient to the Lord. You won't find it anywhere in Scripture that happened. The only time the church grew was the people being obedient to the Lord. Oh boy. All right. <clears throat> Verse 12 says this. It, it's terrifying. I want you, I guarantee you, it was terrifying. He says, You want to know why they turned their backs before the enemy? It's because of that. And then he says this unless you destroy the devoted things from among you, unless you get rid of it, Joshua, don't come back asking for an answer. Because I'm giving you the answer. There's some devoted things there that they wasn't supposed to take. And they need to get rid of it. And unless it's gone, don't come back here anymore. You say, oh, God, wouldn't say, listen, he's given the answer. Why are you going back trying to get a different answer when he gave you the right answer? What we do is this. God gives us an answer and we wait a couple of days and we go back into our prayer closet hoping God's changed his mind about the answer that he gave to us. We feel that if we hold off long enough from doing what God has asked us to do, he'll change his mind in what he wants us to do. No, it's not. He's going to come right back at us with the exact same thing and say, hey, I already gave you the answer. You didn't deal with it. So now you want the answer. Here it is again. <laughs> same answer. Same answer. Anyway, moving on. Hmm. Verse 12 is truly going to be the key part this morning and where we're at. Verse 11, verse 12, these, these are going to be it because we, we've got to see what's going on. We've got to see what's really happened. We've got to see what's really taking place, really, to say this. I'm not giving you any more power until you do what I ask you to do. You'll have no more victory until you do what I ask you. Listen to me. You want the victory? Do what God's asked you to do. Quit making excuses for the reason of whatever, whatever, whatever. You want more victory, do what God asks you to do. Well, I just don't know if he'll give me the victory or not. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. He already said that he was the victor. He already said that he conquered. He already said that. So what? quit worrying about everything else and just be in him. Verse 12 would tell us this therefore the people of Israel cannot but stand before their enemies watch this they turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you King James version in that would use this word called accursed unless you get rid of the accursed things that are before you. Unless those are gone. These, these devoted things. It, it literally. Watch it. It literally means. That word literally means. Things that are hostile to theocracy. And you say. Well, well what is theocracy? It, it's a system of government. And how things run with God. And God says this. Because they've done that. It is broken how I'm trying to govern the people. Because I've already gave them the commandment. I've already told them what they wanted to do. And what they've done has broken into my theocracy of how I need to do things in their lives. This, this divine guidance that comes from God that he gives to people. That he literally says, hey, I'll put people in place that are going to be led by God to give us the answers that we need so that we can stay in tune with him. But when that is, watch this, when that is broken and no longer righteous, receive the theocracy of how God wants to move is now broken. You, you wonder 
while all of a sudden people are like, man, oh yeah, God's moving, God's moving, God's moving. And then you look at the book of Acts. You know why things worked in the book of Acts? Because God's government was not being torn apart. They all came together and of one mind and one accord. And when you do that, then that means that you're focused on his government. Now listen, not the government that we think about. We're talking about God's government and how he runs things. And he runs things in this way that he comes in and he says, If you'll keep my laws and my commandments, the government, the commandments, things that I've given to you, you'll realize that it is beneficial in your life. Jesus would come in and he says, yeah, there's two greatest commandments that go with all them. And hangs all the prophet and all the law. Listen to this. He didn't say it did away with them. He said all the prophet and all the law hang on these two. And so if we're not doing these, listen to me, church. If you're not doing the two greatest commandments, you've broken the theocracy of God. Because you said his government and his way is not the best. And so if we put anything else, anything, listen to anything that takes the place of God. Anything that we put in place of God, in his rightful place, is the thing that we are devoted to. Now, we want to say this, I'm devoted to God, I'm devoted to God, I'm devoted to God. How much you given to him, spent with him, how much you truly care, how you're treating other people, what are the things that you do? Why? Because that shows your devotion. Because all, what's it, the two greatest hang on everything else. And if you can't do the two greatest, then how can you love? How, how can we really do those things? See, God says there is a theocracy of who I am, and I do it on purpose because he knows what's best. And our lives are ruled and governed in that way. And so he gives us the first commandment, that you shall have no other gods. But why is that? Because he's a theocracy. He knows how his government should run. Verse 11, if you'll go back with me for just a moment, we have to kind of go back and, and look at this. Oh, I want us to look at this one part as well today that's in here. And so now we see this system of government of God, this theocracy and how things run, the commandments that he's given, the devoted things, the accursed things, how things are supposed to be put in place. And then as we go back there, we see this part today in, in verse 11. Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Now, I want you to listen to this. They have stolen and they have lied and put them among their own belongings. Now, Joshua's getting this. God's revealing this to him. He still don't know who it is. All, watch this, all Joshua is asking for is this. I need to know why we got defeated when we went to the next battle. Because you said you was going to be with us. You promised you'd be there. And you said, just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. That's what you told me, God. So what I need to know now is this. Why did we go to the next battle and get defeated? And God says, I'll give you the answer. Because the theocracy of what I gave, of who that I know best, was broken and they have sinned. They have stolen and they have lied. Watch this. They're breaking commandment after commandment after commandment that has been given. And he says, you want to know why? That's why. Because I'm not a God that blesses that stuff. They've stolen and they've lied and they put them away with their own belongings. Whoo. Oh, me. You say, well, what is it? Oh, we're getting there. I am so thankful that God just don't leave us hanging and end the story. And we don't know anything about it. I promise you, God pinpoints everything right down to the last little detail. You want God to speak? Get serious. You want to speak it? Don't say. You want to, you, words mean nothing until you put it in action. Whew. 
that, that word lied in this verse, that, that, that word is a, is, is a Hebrew word. And in the, in the King James, because that's how, that's how it was translated, right? King James translated everything. So we got to go back to the King James to, to get the Greek and the Hebrew in the sense of what they've got. And so when we see this, we look back at it. And that word lied means dissembled. And so all of a sudden we, we look at that and we say, well, what, what in the world would that mean? Well, it, it, what it does is this. Listen, what it does, it, it's a verb, how it's you, because it's action, right? They lied. They did something, right? That's an action form of doing something. When you lie, that, that's what? That's action. It's a verb. And so as he does this, it, it's used in such a way, that this word here, this lie, it's used in such a way that deals with a complete action or situation. It means it's already taken place. It's already been done. This is where it's at. The, the action happened, and this is what's got to be dealt with. But really what it deals with is this. Now, this is what we got to grab. Oh, I'm, I'm trying, Lord, you got to help me here with this. What, what it really deals with more is not how the action took place. It deals with, watch it, it deals with more, it deals with the how, I'm sorry, I got it, it deals with the how, because I'm trying to figure out the, the, the Hebrew, it deals with the how, not the when, it deals with how, what, how did this happen, not when did it happen, how did this happen, how did this really take place? Place. So how did this action come about? How did this line really do? Not when. Everybody wants to do this. Listen to me. When's the last time you stood up and you said, I remember when. Praise the Lord, you remember when. But I promise you, if you don't know how, you didn't get it. Oh, boy. Some of y'all are tore all pieces. <laughs> You can't be saved outside of Jesus. You say, well, I know when. Well, how? What? If we can't explain the elementary principle of Jesus Christ, how's anybody else ever getting saved? Because you can tell somebody when all you want to. They're going to say how. How? That is what this takes place. This is his action. And if you look at verses 20 and 21. 20 and 21. Watch this. God does not leave things undone. And so when he says, I'll reveal to you, he says, I'll get it all the way down to the exact one. You go to verses 20 and 21 of this same chapter. And when you look at that, man, all of a sudden you realize, man, Things have truly taken place. And in verses 20 and 21, you'll see that and Achan answered Joshua. Remember, it's the sin of Achan. He didn't know that at the time. And God says, you quit wallowing. You're looking for answers for me. Praise the Lord for that. Now I'm going to give you an answer. Get up off your face. Do something about it. I'm going to continue to reveal things. If you're faithful in that, I know you'll be faithful in this. So I'm going to reveal this to you. Wait to see if you're going to do something about it. Now that you've done something about it, I'll reveal the next step to you. Why'd you quit looking for the end result and trying to bypass all the steps God wants to do? Because in those steps, God's doing something for us as well. And so we, we see here that all of a sudden we get all the way down here in verses 20 and 21. And Achan answered Joshua, truly, I have sinned. Past tense. Truly, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. Oh, boy. Watch this. And this is what I did. Past tense. Verse 21 starts out with this. When I saw the spoil, a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. But, but old pastor right there, it was, it was when. He's talking about when. He, he went back to the when. You just said it wasn't about the when. Uh, yeah, because he didn't stop the sentence. When is not the important part. What's the important part? How. What? Go back to the when, but unless you know the how, you'll stay in a when. When did this happen? Why? Yeah. Did you ever get up? No, I don't know. 
How? That's what people are going to tell you. Why? Because they need to know the how. He says this in verse 21. Then I coveted them. Uh oh. What? And took them, and see, they are hidden in the earth. Watch what God does. God just doesn't reveal who it is. He reveals down to the very pinpoint of where it's in the ground. If you're faithful to God, he'll reveal things to you, but are you willing to accept it? Some of us are so scared of what God's going to say about our family, we can't even pray about them. Because the last thing I want to do is have to get up. Off of my face after he's given me an answer and deal with whatever he said about. But yet what we'll say is this, Pastor, I went in the prayer closet and prayed about it. Well, what did he say? Well, I really don't want to tell you. Why is that? Because I realize he gave me an answer that I don't want to deal with. And so what happens is this, 15 years down the road, you wonder why you got the same cycle in your family again. Oh, wait, 30 years down the road, you wonder why you got the same cycle again. Uh, that's the reason, why. Uh, that's the reason, Lord, you're going to have to help me. That's the reason a lot of families think that they can raise their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren all the same way without ever getting right with them to start with and say, hey, I messed up the first time. What makes me think I can get it right the second time, the third time, the fourth time without actually getting into him and saying, Lord, reveal to me what I did wrong. Because all I'm doing is raising up another generation to be like the generation I had. And we come in and we sit on our pew. And what we say is this. Well, I just don't know. I just don't know. He revealed it. You refused it. He revealed it. We refused it. And we wonder why the third and the fourth generation is no better than the first. Lord, we need help. Because our prayer closets have become a place to where all we want to do is ask people if they prayed, but never if they got an answer. Never if they did something with the answer. Because most people are afraid to move after the answers come. Well, that's just too I just don't know if I can do that. Last thing I'd want is some of my family to look at. Last thing I'd want is... Should be the last thing you want is them die and go to hell. Oh, but keep doing it generation after generation. And then blame every pastor that you've ever had that it's their fault. When you're not willing to do what you're supposed to be doing in your prayer closet. And keep, keep telling them, I'm doing the best I can. Because on judgment day, those words won't stand. Because the best that you can do is filthy rags. Paul even said it himself. My righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. Until we truly get down and we say, woe is me. Woe is me. Quit blaming everybody else for what you've refused to do. Sean, Dr. Flynn, what? You can't help everybody. Samantha, Amanda, you can be back, they can be back there with your teens. Quit getting people to do your job. You want them to try to figure out the problems in your family. When God said, if you'll do that, I can promise you this, they can spend a lot more time getting in the Word and helping your child grow than they are trying to figure out and be a detective. It's not their job. But yet we want to come in and we want to say, well, Lord, if you'll do that, just send somebody else. Quit being a coward all the time. Get it to where people can really do what they've been called to do and pour into somebody else's life. Quit wanting somebody else to raise your child, your grandchild, your great-grand. Quit waiting for somebody else to do what God has put you in this world to do. He wants to use you. And then you wonder why our church can't get nothing to go anywhere. Tonight I'll do some more about that because we're going to reveal some things that maybe we can do. But maybe we're not going to be able to do it if we're willing just to stay in the same cycle all the time. Oh, money's going to solve the issue? Ask Solomon about that. He had more money than everybody in this country combined. Richest man ever. Vanity of vanities, he said. You know why? It wasn't worth it. Keep pouring money at it. 
Keep doing all these things. Tonight you're going to say, well, Pastor, you're, you're presenting some of these things. No, I'm presenting these things for when we actually get serious. Because if you think doing another program, building another building is going to make this church grow, then we've jumped right into Satan's lie. Because until we do what we're supposed to do individually and as a family and as a husband and wife, then I promise you this, this church will die flat. And we'll come in and we can keep, listen to me, keep pointing the fingers. Because eventually you're going to run out of fingers because eventually you've got to stand and it's going to be you alone in judgment. You want something to happen in your family? Get serious. And then when you get serious, step back and say, now, Lord, I'm sorry about that. Listen to me. There's some corporate repentance that needs to happen in this church that people ain't willing to do. Now, listen to me. Some of y'all are going to say amen and yes, that's right and everything else. But the question is this. Have you prayed about it if it's you? I've already been in my prayer closet. When the time's right, I'm going to reveal some things. I promise you, there's some things that's been done until we truly come together and we say, Lord, we're sorry. God ain't doing nothing. You say, well, somebody got saved. Oh, praise the Lord. Let's keep having that popcorn. And maybe once every six, seven years, we can really get something. Or we can actually come together and say, hey, the book of Acts was this. People getting real with God before something real with God can happen over here. Ooh, pastor, preaching too much, preaching too much. Okay, help me move on. You say, Pastor, do you have to do that while the teens and the kids are in here? Do you have to do that? Yeah, yeah. I don't want them growing up the same way. I don't want them playing church. We've got enough Nazarene churches. That I'm just talking about Nazarene churches. I can get you the statistics for the rest of the churches all over. But the thing about it, we got too many Nazarene churches. Watch it. Closing because they're dead. Not dead, watch it, not even dead numerically, not dead financially, they're dead spiritually. And God said, I won't bless anything else until you get that right. Then, Pastor, why do you keep giving uh, a, a chance for an offering and taking up tithe? Because I'm trying to give us time to repent. And that the reason we're really putting the check in is for the right reason. And by the way, don't think that you're paying me. Well, pastor, that money go there. If somebody were to say, I'm sorry, you're gone. If the government were to come in and say, you're close, can I tell you, God's still going to take care of me. He's still going to take care of me. Listen to me. You better be doing the same thing about your job. Because if you think your job is giving you the money, then guess what? That job ain't no good anyway. You're wasting your time going. Because that ain't the reason you're there anyway. You are there to share Jesus. You were put in that place to share Jesus. Be that light. Be that light. Be that light. You see, the thing about it is this. It had nothing to do about the when Achan did it. It dealt with the how. That whole word deals with the how. That's the reason it was used here. God's not stupid. He knows what he's writing presented to this through the spirit given to them and they wrote this down it wasn't that Achan saw these things listen to me it wasn't that Achan's eyes listen he says when I saw it it wasn't that he saw it was the problem it wasn't when he saw it that it was it it was about the when it wasn't about the when. It was about the how he saw them. Because watch what he says right after that. When he saw them, watch it, it's because how he saw them. He saw them as something he could take. It wasn't about the when. He saw, watch it, he saw them with something that was already in his heart that God's getting ready to show. You say, oh, it's about the when. No, it's about the how. We want to focus on the wind so that we ain't got to deal with God dealing with us really personally about what's really going on. It's the how. Uh, real quick, listen to me. If, if you see a woman that's dressed immodestly, it ain't about the wind. 
So if you have thoughts that are raging and they just keep raging, it ain't about the wind. Don't go back and say, well, it's because that commercial. It's when it came on. It wasn't because they were walking down the street. It's when that, no, it's the how. How are your eyes looking, men? It ain't about the wind. It's your heart issue. Because the heart changes the eyesight. Well, I just can't get past it. And what we say is it, well, just don't look. Here's the thing I'm saying is this. No, we're not going out willfully looking at things. But I can tell you this. When something does pass by, guess what? It's not the when, it's the how that I say, no, no, thank you. I serve Jesus. Oh, come on. Women, same way. Don't think the pornography's any different. Watch this. It's actually in a higher rate for women than it is for men right now. You know why? I, I can, I can, I'm down here. I'm going to give my opinion real quick. You know why that is? Because men hadn't stepped up to be men of God. I tell you what, you be a man of God, your woman will see you attractive. Oh, some of you are like, well, I've got it all going on. Well, you ain't going to have it going on one day. And we're, hey, listen to me, listen to me. I'm just going to be straight up with you because I, I've counseled people sitting in offices, sitting in their homes. You know what happened? They thought they had it going on one day. But then eventually, when it wasn't going on no more, and they couldn't bring it in, they couldn't do all these things, you know what one did? One spouse decided, I'll find somebody else that's got it going on. You see, you want... Well, we got kids in here. We got to... Oh, boy. That's fine. Don't talk about, let your kids grow up and do the exact same thing you did. Let them do it. And then wonder why their marriages ain't working out. Wonder why they don't come to church. Wonder why, point their finger, preacher just preach too hard. <laughs> preacher was just too dull. Preacher wasn't loud enough. Preacher was too loud. Preacher, what did? Sunday school just wasn't any fun. Teacher was just dull. Did it? Well, it ain't about when, it's the how of the heart. Oh, boy, we're getting there. We're getting there. I'm almost done. You can start playing. You can just keep doing it. Because how he saw these things that were there revealed greater of the things going on in his life. What he should have done is this. Went back to, I know what God has commanded. Don't take anything. You go back and read it. He says, don't you take a thing out of there. All that's going to be burned. It's given to destruction. Watch this. You know why? Because God's saying this. I've got something greater for you if you'll bypass all this junk. Listen to me. In your life, God's got something greater for you if you'll bypass the junk. If you'll quit looking at it and getting hung up on it, it's the how, not the when. See that word disassembled, that word lied, it means deceive. Because watch it, he wouldn't have hid it if he wasn't trying to deceive what was really going on. Then you know the reason that you may be hiding things in your life today? Because you're deceiving. Why? Because you really don't want people to see who you really are. Why? Because God has dealt with that. And he's already dealt with it before. And he's dealing with it again today. The question is this. Are you going to keep deceiving? Are you going to keep lying about it? Are you going to go out and tell people that you're fine? Are you going to go out and tell people that I'm really close to God? When when down the, what, in the depths of it, it's the how about what's going on with the heart. And now you're just trying to deceive it because you can't deceive God. That's the reason he's dealing right now. That's the reason the Spirit's speaking. That's the reason he's coming in. And he's saying, if you'll let me deal with the how, I can transform everything in your life. I'll transform everything in your life if you'll let me deal with the how. Because once your heart changes, you'll never see things the same. It'll be different. It'll be different. Listen, you say, well, pastor, that's Old Testament. Let me take you to New Testament. Galatians chapter 2, Paul's writing to them. And he's talking about something that happened in the book of Acts. And they, you go back there and read that story in the book of Acts. And as he gets into this, we find Paul talks about that he had to oppose Peter when he got there. 
He said, I had to oppose Peter. Listen, he's writing this to the Galatians. He said, I had to oppose Peter to his face when I got there. And as he does this, you see, it it goes on to give this, this account, this biblical account that takes place. And it goes like this. Now watch real quick. Real quick, you're going to say, is this really going to matter? Oh, it's absolutely going to matter today in our lives. Because we want to take Old Testament and say it's not relevant. And if it's not in the New Testament, I want to hear it. So I'm going to give you something in the New Testament. That way we can't get away from it. So Peter is eating with the Gentiles. And all of a sudden, watch this. He's eating with the Gentiles at a table. And all of a sudden, the Jews walk through this open door. And they come in. And Scripture tells us that when the Jews showed up. This is Paul writing. And Paul says, this is the reason that I had to oppose Peter. He said, when the Jews showed up, it says this. Then he separated himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of the Jews and their thinking of him sitting there. Oh. We're going to get a little bit further. Paul says so much that because of what Peter did. Now listen, this this is scriptural. It says this in Acts chapter 15. You'll find this story. And it says this. It says it's so much that when Peter did that, that the rest of them did the same thing. Now watch. And even Barnabas that was with Paul in his missionary journey, watch this, was led astray. Because Peter, what, all because Peter, all because Peter got up, all because Peter moved from a table, all because he truly just was like, I oh, didn't move spots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But see, Galatians chapter 2, verse 13 truly tells the story here in this part. And it says this I'll read it to you in the King James, because I really want you to grab hold of what's taking place. And the other Jews, watch this. This is in verse, and the other Jews dissembled. I think we've heard that word before. Joshua. God spoke it himself. Paul writes this about Peter. And he says, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away by their dissimulation. You say, Pastor, what is that? Well, guess what happens in the Greek? Because we had the Hebrew in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament we have Greek. Now watch what happens. That dissembled, still the same word, used in the same way, but now it's in the Greek. Watch what happens to it. It now becomes the meaning of hypocritical. Hypocrite. Hypocrisy. The definition, if you were to look it up, you know what the definition of hypocritical is? In, in, watch it, in the worldly dictionary, behaving in such a way that suggests one has higher standards or more noble beliefs than is the case. So before I go any further, the thing is this. You claim to serve Jesus Is that real or are you a hypocrite? Are you coming in and telling people that you're living to a higher standard of what God calls you to, yet Monday you don't? Yet by Wednesday you're already getting to this point to where you're like, well, I know that was Sunday and I really want, but now I'm just going to kind of back off of that. Can I just tell you what Scripture called? It says it's a hypocrite. (sighs) You see, Hebrew word meant to deceive the Greek word means to be hypocritical which is still the same thing as deceitful because you are disguising yourself to be something that you're not which is deceptive God doesn't change in how he calls out sin and God says watch this it's not about the when it's about the how People have tried to pray. People have tried to read their Bible. People have tried to listen to every gospel music that there is going. 
all the while while wondering why the victory hasn't come in their lives. You see, the question has to be asked. Am I being deceptive because of something I'm not willing to reveal in my life, even though I know it's wrong? Achan knew it was wrong, yet when he saw it, he gave into it. Why? Not because of the when, because of the how. God had already gave the proclamation. He already gave the commandment. Don't you touch any of that stuff. You don't need it. It won't benefit you any. And that's the reason he had to go in. And he had to be deceitful in the way that he did it. He hid it underneath it. Now watch this. His deceitfulness cost 36 men their lives. You say, Pastor, it's not the same. Oh, come on. How many people have looked at a deceitful life that you may be living and have died and gone to hell because they thought they were okay? Because you come to church and you say, I'm good. I got it going on. Yet when they see you out there, it's opposite. That's a hypocrite. It's deceitful. It means you're coming here. Watch this. Whatever you do in your home. Whatever you do when you go out to that restaurant. You should be doing the same thing here. So watch this. Get upset at me. You're going to have one and throw it back at the restaurant. Don't you dare be afraid to bring it in here. Well, pastor, you're going to watch all that ugly, nasty, filth, and X-rated movies in your home. Don't you dare be afraid to come in here and play it on your phone. You're going to look at all that garbage of naked men and women. Don't you dare be afraid to pull it up right here. Why? Because you're a hypocrite if you don't. You're deceiving if you don't. And who in here are you willing to allow to look at you and die and go to hell because they thought it was right? Oh, pastor, I just don't think it's ever going to happen. Well, when you tried to erase the scripture. Because it's in there for our benefit. You want something really happen in this church? In your home? It's about high time we come clean. People look at me and they say, well, pastor, what did you do while you did Sunday night? I'm the leader of this church. When it's time to repent, I'll repent. Listen, I didn't do anything wicked. I didn't do anything in that sort of way. Nothing like that. But when the Lord speaks, you better do what he speaks. Watch this. Because what? when he speaks and you don't do it, don't look for the victory. You want to know why I got the victory? Because I was obedient. I don't care what anybody else said. You, you do what you want to do. But the reason that I can have the victory, reason I can shout, reason I can run, reason I can preach the way I do, I got the victory in who he is. You don't have to have the victory, but you can sit here like a knot on a log, too. And eventually, your knot on a log will be in your home because you won't be coming here. Because you'll think it's me hurting your feelings, not realizing the Holy Spirit is cutting right through everything. Because I can promise you one thing. It ain't about my preaching. My preaching ain't no good. His word is the thing that's good. So if you're hung up on my preaching, you ain't hung up on the word. What? If you're critiquing my preaching, you ain't hung up on the word. If you're more worried about what I'm saying here, you ain't got your Bible open. His word is the word that cuts. It ain't my words. He is good and he is faithful. You see, it ain't about when it happened. It's about how it happened. And I just wondered this morning... I don't know if you realize this or not, but if you don't put away the things in your life that are hindering you, you wonder why children have the same habits as their parents. Even as much as I have sat down with people and canceled them and they've said this to me. I tried forever not to be like my mom or dad, but it happened. You know why? Because the how was never dealt with. It ain't about the when they got there. The how was never dealt with. Listen to me. Your parents may have already went on to whichever. You ain't got to be your parents. 
Your parents may still be living. And they may be living however. You ain't got to be your parents. Your children may be living however. But you ain't got to be your children. But I can promise you this. You want to see a difference? You be honest with God. And I can promise you when you're honest with God, you'll see breakthroughs happen that you didn't know was coming. Even when people may think that you've got something else in mind or whatever it is, when you're obedient to God, He'll break, watch this, He'll break down not only the wall there, but He'll break down some other walls that need to be broken down. And once you can finally get to the source of it, you can say, Lord, get that out of my life. I don't want that here. Just remove it. I don't want to be like my parents. My parents love the Lord. You said, Pat, you don't want to be like, no, I want to be like Jesus. When's the last time you pointed your kids toward Jesus instead of you? Don't be like me, be like Jesus. I'm going to serve him, I'm going to walk with him, but be like Jesus. When's the last time you've really revealed as he has spoken? What's going on in your life? When's the last time you admitted that God was right when he checked you?